Hello and welcome to Evacor Healthcare's educational webinar series. My name is Bill Cornelius with Evacor Healthcare. Evacor is a company that empowers the improvement of care by connecting patients, providers, and health plans with intelligent evidence-based solutions to enable better outcomes. If you would like to learn more about Evacor, please reach out to sales at evacor.com for more information. Throughout 2021, Evacor will host free educational webinars that include guest speakers, as well as Evacor subject matter experts to discuss today's most pressing healthcare topics. Stay tuned for our future webinars with new topics presented each month. And now it is my privilege to introduce you to our panelists. First, our host for today will be Rick Emery, Vice President of Comprehensive Oncology Strategy at Evacor. He will be joined by Dr. Stephen Hamilton, Chief of Evacor's Medical Oncology Services. Dr. Hamilton will overview the major categories of medical oncology treatment and supportive drugs, how these treatments work to fight cancer, and finally, how medical oncology has changed over the last two decades and what we can expect in the future. Before we begin, just a quick reminder to please submit your questions using the question feature in WebEx. This presentation will be recorded and will be available following the webinar at evacore.com slash insights. Rick, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Bill, and welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Hopefully you've all seen our Medical Oncology 101 quiz and have had a chance to submit your answers. If not, please take a moment to do that now as we get started. As you may know, the field of medical oncology continues to advance at an accelerating pace. In 2020, the FDA approved 59 oncology drug approvals, including new drugs, biosimilars, and drugs with expanded indications. Amidst this rapid pace of change, we thought it would be helpful to take a breath and ground ourselves in an overview of the field of medical oncology, its history, current state, and potential, potential future advancements. This webinar is a great opportunity to improve your understanding of medical oncology and ask any questions that you may have. Please submit your questions at any time during the webinar in the Q&A section of the WebEx. I will pose those questions to Dr. Hamilton during the Q&A portion of today's webinar at the end of Dr. Hamilton's presentation. Now, let's take a look at the quiz results. And I see the poll has ended. So, looking to see the results displayed in just a moment. Okay, I'm not seeing the, the poll results. Ah, uh, there they are. Thanks. Sorry, I guess it just takes a moment. So, uh, actually, a, a, a distribution of responses and um, excellent. Uh, so, first, uh, we'll go through the uh, the questions just to provide the, the correct answers. And this is just fun. You know, we're just we're just trying to do something to kind of get get people engaged and and thinking about medical oncology and. Um, uh, and lots more to come after this. But the first question was, oncology drug spend accounts for uh, what portion of total health plan drug spend? The correct answer is C, 33%, about a third. Uh, the next question was, what was the first chemotherapy agent introduced? Uh, the correct answer, uh, it looks like most people got the correct answer, which was nitrogen mustard. And the last question uh, looks like folks did very well here. How many new oncology drugs did the FDA approve in 2020? Uh, and the correct answer was 21. So well done, everyone. Uh, and now it is my privilege to introduce Dr. Steve Hamilton, the chief of Evacor's medical oncology program, to deliver his medical oncology 101 presentation. Steve? Great. Thank you, Rick. And it really is my pleasure to have the opportunity today to talk to you about an area I'm very passionate about, which is medical oncology. And so here's our agenda today and some of the topics that we will be discussing. And I'm going to begin with a really basic question. You know, what is medical oncology? And so there really are three ways cancer is generally treated. Uh, it can be treated by surgery, 
it can be treated by radiation therapy, and it can be treated by chemotherapy. And so medical oncology is the use of chemotherapy to uh, treat cancer. And I wanna just highlight that I'm gonna use the term chemotherapy during this uh, uh, presentation today to really indicate any medication given to treat cancer. However, as we will be discussing, there are a lot of different classes of chemotherapy and we're gonna talk about each one of these. The one other point I wanna make here is that um, it's important to understand that surgery and radiation therapy are what we call local treatments for cancer. And what I mean by that is that a surgeon will go in and remove a cancer and radiation therapy will direct a beam of radiation therapy to where the cancer is in the patient's body. But only chemotherapy can treat the entire body, can treat the entire uh, area where cancer may be involved. And so we call this systemic therapy. And it's important because cancer is oftentimes a systemic disease. The one other point I wanna make is that one, two, or all three of these modalities may be used to treat a particular patient's cancer. So now I just wanna talk a minute about, you know, how is cancer diagnosed? I mean, what leads it to cancer being identified in the first place? Well, of course, there are routine screening tests that we do to identify cancer, hopefully at an earlier stage. So mammograms, screening colonoscopy, low-dose CT scans. However, sometimes cancer is identified uh, as an incidental finding on a radiology test or a lab test that was done for another reason. And even sometimes it can be found as an incidental finding at surgery for an unrelated problem. Um, patient signs and symptoms are also oftentimes a clue that lead uh, the physician to uh, pursue and, and investigate whether or not the patient may have cancer. When we talk about diagnosing cancer, there are a number of important ancillary tests. And so pathology, of course, from either a biopsy or a surgery specimen is extremely important to make the correct diagnosis of cancer. And any more genomic and molecular profiling of that tumor is extremely important, not only in determining the type of cancer, but what might be the most effective therapies for that cancer. And of course, we use radiographic imaging, not only in the diagnosis of cancer, but also in the staging of cancer and to monitor whether or not a cancer is responding to treatment. And then finally, basic blood test, particularly for hematologic cancers like leukemia and multiple myeloma, blood tests can play an important role in the diagnosis. But now I'm gonna start talking about chemotherapy. And I wanna begin by talking about how chemotherapy is given. So it can be given as a pill, as a self-administered oral therapy for a patient. And one of the classes of drugs we will talk about, it commonly comes in a pill form. And so we'll talk more about that. Chemotherapy can be given as an injection. So this can be an, an injection underneath the skin or deep into the muscle. Um, but the most common way that injectable chemotherapy is given is through a vein. And so one way to do that is through what we call a peripheral vein, a peripheral venous infusion in the patient's arm or hand, as is shown here. Part of the problem, though, is that over time, as a patient is receiving chemotherapy and over an extended period, eventually the veins can give out. And some of the cytotoxic chemotherapy drugs that we'll be talking about uh, shortly can also really scar and damage the veins. And so for that reason, um, several decades ago, there was developed a device called an infusaport or a portacath. And here's a little schematic diagram of, you'll see this little reservoir and you'll see this little cath that are going into this very large vein underneath the collarbone that's called the subclavian vein. And once it's implanted by a surgeon, it's completely underneath the patient's skin, so the patient can wash and bathe with this. And then whenever we need to administer chemotherapy, we just take a little needle, pop it into that port, and are able to infuse chemotherapy uh, safely into the patient's large subclavian vein. So that's how chemotherapy can be administered. Now I wanna talk a little bit about where injectable chemotherapy is given. And so most injectable chemotherapy is given in an outpatient setting, either an outpatient physician office or an outpatient hospital infusion center. And I will tell you that either place is equally good. They're high quality places to receive cancer care. Um, 
But I want to point out that outpatient hospital infusion centers, I kind of chose these pictures intentionally. Look how much, you know, that we have marbled floors, big picturesque windows. So there's more overhead in the outpatient hospital infusion center compared to the, the private physician office. Um, and because of that, hospital outpatient infusion centers oftentimes charge two to three times uh, the cost of uh, on the chemotherapy drugs is, is charged in a private physician office. Another setting where chemotherapy can be administered is in the inpatient hospital setting. And this is primarily used for more complex treatments, for example, treating acute leukemia. It's a very complex and intense treatment. Or for certain drugs that have significant potential for toxicity, like CAR T cell therapy that we'll be talking about. And then finally, chemotherapy can be administered at home. And the most common way that we do home chemotherapy is by use of what's called an infusion pump. So there are some types of chemotherapy that have to be given as a two to three day infusion. And historically, we would have to put a patient in the hospital for that kind of treatment. But these miniaturized infusion pumps that the patient wears much like a fanny pack can deliver a chemotherapy while the patient's at home or while they're going to work. And then they just come back in and get that disconnected afterwards. We also saw an uptick in home administration of chemotherapy during the COVID pandemic. So I think we learned some lessons there that you can actually administer certain types of chemotherapy at home. So we may see the use of home administration of chemotherapy expand in the future. And now I wanna just dig in a little bit and talk about some of the different classes of chemotherapy that we use today. And the first class is cytotoxic chemotherapy. And so this is chemotherapy that generally leads to cancer cell death by interfering with cell division and cell growth. And so you'll see over here in this schematic diagram that we have DNA and how it can be synthesized and transcribed and mitosis. And so these drugs can block multiple different areas in DNA processing that lead to cell division and growth. And I think the key thing to understand about cytotoxic chemotherapy is that it tends to hit faster growing cells more than slower growing cells. And since cancer is faster growing generally than our normal body cells, cytotoxic chemotherapy tends to damage cancer cells much more than it does our normal body cells. However, because of the fact that the cytotoxic chemotherapy does hit our normal body cells, this accounts for a lot of the side effects, the hair loss, diarrhea, the low blood counts, are all an effect of the fact that the cytotoxic chemotherapy can damage our normal body cells. And so when I start talking about some of these other newer classes of agents, you'll hear me use the phrase targeted therapy because they are really designed to target just the cancer, whereas cytotoxic chemotherapy unfortunately does hit our normal body cells. When it comes to the cost of cytotoxic chemotherapy, this is generally less expensive than the other classes of drugs. Many of these drugs are generic now, and so annualized costs are oftentimes less than $10,000. However, there are new cytotoxic drugs that have been coming out on the market in recent years that come in with very high price points, as noted here with lubronectidin. And so now I wanna talk about the first class of what we could uh, consider targeted therapy, and that is monoclonal antibodies. And so these include drugs like bevacizumab and rituximab. And so these are man-made proteins. More specifically, they are antibodies. And they are designed to attack antigens on the cancer surface. So that's why they're targeted. They go after the cancer cells. And then once they bind, they can lead to cancer cell death by a variety of mechanisms that are shown over here in the schematic diagram. Uh, because these drugs are targeted, they are generally much better tolerated than cytotoxic chemotherapy, so they don't tend to have hair loss, nausea and vomiting, and some of the other side effects of cytotoxic chemotherapy. However, because they are proteins, they can lead sometimes to serious allergic reactions, and they can sometimes have what we call off-target effects. So even though they're targeting the cancer cell, they can sometimes have adverse effects on other body organs, though fortunately these are uncommon. These drugs are oftentimes combined with cytotoxic chemotherapy, which improves the effectiveness of both forms of therapy. 
And these drugs come in with price points of anywhere from $100,000 to $300,000 a year. Biosimilars have come to market for Bevacizumab, Rituximab, and Trastuzumab. And these are cheaper, but only about 15% lower cost than the reference product. The next type of targeted therapy I want to talk about are so-called small molecule targeted therapy. And these are the drugs that are usually pills. So these are oral administered drugs. And these small molecule drugs can actually penetrate through the cancer cell membrane. And these drugs target certain molecular pathways that are actually used by the cancer to survive and grow. But it's important to understand about these drugs that they will only work if that targeted pathway is being used by the cancer for cell growth and, and, and uh, progression. And so if we look at our little schematic diagram over here on the right, uh, there is a mutation that is oftentimes found in melanoma and certain types of colon cancer called a BRAF mutation. And so this BRAF gene, when it gets mutated, it turns this pathway on that leads to unregulated growth of cancer cells. And so we have some small molecule target therapies that attack this BRAF gene. And when we administer those, it stops this pathway and can stop cancer cell growth. These drugs, again, are targeted. And so overall, the side effects of these drugs are generally well tolerated. And that's important because patients oftentimes remain on these drugs for years. The side effects really depend upon the pathway that's blocked. So I've given a couple of examples of some side effects. And these are usually easy enough to manage. The cost of these drugs generally run $150,000 or more a year. And right now, there's very few generic formulations available today, as most of these drugs are still under patent. Now I want to talk about immunotherapy. And it's been really the game changer in the last several years in treating uh, cancer patients. And so these include drugs like nivolumab and pembrolizumab. And these are technically monoclonal antibodies, but how they differ from the monoclonal antibodies I talked about earlier is that they don't directly kill the cancer cell. They actually unleash the immune system to allow the immune system to kill the cancer cell. And so I wanna walk you through how this works. So in this schematic diagram here, you'll see this tumor cell, and then you'll see this immune cell called a T cell. And T cells normally can recognize cancer cells by antigens that are on the cancer cell surface. And when they bind to that antigen, that activates the immune system to attack the tumor cell and will normally lead to cancer cell death. But cancers have ways of escaping the immune system. And one way they do that is that they produce receptors on their surface. And one of these receptors is called a PDL1 receptor. And this receptor can interact with the receptor on the T cell called the PD1. And when these interact, it shuts the T cell down. And so this is one way that the cancer can escape the immune system. And so what uh, the scientists did is they developed these monoclonal antibodies that bound either to the PDL1 on the cancer cell or the PD1 on the T cell. It doesn't matter which one they block because once they block it, that interaction with the PDL1 and PD1 can no longer occur. And so now when the T cell recognizes the cancer cell, it's able to destroy it. And so because this is targeted therapy, again, this drug, these drugs are usually very well tolerated. And when side effects develop, it's usually due to overactivity of our own immune system. And so the immune system can sometimes attack our normal body cells. These side effects are called immune-related adverse events, and they can occasionally be severe and life-threatening, but are, they're usually able to be effectively managed with cortical steroids. These drugs come in with very high price points of over $150,000 a year, and they also can be combined with cytotoxic chemotherapy. Now, the final class of chemotherapy drug I want to talk about is CAR T cell therapy, and it doesn't fit nice and neatly into one of the categories I discussed. I tend to call CAR T cell therapy a living drug. And to understand why, if you look over here about how we make CAR T cell therapy, so it really begins by uh, collecting T cells out of the patient's bloodstream. And then we send the patient's T cells 
to the laboratory where scientists will insert a gene. And this gene encodes a protein that's called a CAR protein. And this CAR protein is then expressed on the surface of these modified CAR T cells. And this CAR protein has antigen specificity for the cancer. So this can, just like monoclonal antibodies, this can bind to and identify cancer cells. And then once that binding occurs, this special modification of this T cell leads to a very, very dramatic immune response, a much stronger immune response than you would get from native T cells that have not been modified. These cells are then grown in the lab until they reach millions of cells, and then we reinfuse them back into the patient where they seek and destroy the cancer. And I'm going to show you a video of CAR T cells and how they work in just a moment. Because of the very dramatic immune response that CAR T cell therapies cause, we can have a couple of very severe uh, reactions called cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicities. These can prove fatal and they can occur suddenly. And it's because of that that most CAR T cell therapy today is given in the inpatient hospital setting. These drugs have a very high price point of $373,000 to $475,000 for a single infusion. And this does not even account for the cost of the hospitalization and all the supportive therapy. And so the real cost of CAR T cell therapy uh, is generally closer to a million dollars when all is totaled. And here, whoops, let me go back, apologize. And so let me show you here uh, CAR T cell in action. So these little gray blobs are the CAR T cell and you can see it interacting with this cancer cell and it's releasing enzymes and cytokines that then destroy the cancer cell. You can just see these cancer cells are just exploding from the immune response. And so this very dramatic immune response on these modified CAR T cells have led to very high response rates in, in certain resistant cancers like lymphomas, leukemias, and multiple myeloma. Dr. Hamilton, and then, uh, yeah. we, we did receive a, a question uh, that's pertinent to CAR T therapy. I thought I would interject and ask, um, uh -huh. how many infusions, how many CAR T cell therapy you know, sessions uh, are normally uh, required for a patient? Uh it's a single infusion. Now, there, there have been some investigation into repeat exposures to CAR T. So if somebody had a great response, but then the cancer progressed in the future, there are some studies going in looking at giving a second infusion of CAR T, but that still at this point is not proven. So at this point, it's a single infusion. Okay, thank you. Uh, and now the last class of therapy I want to talk about is actually supportive drug therapy. So these are drugs that don't treat the cancer, but they help treat the side effects related to the chemotherapy, particularly to cytotoxic chemotherapy side effects. And so you are probably familiar with myeloid growth factors that help keep the white blood cell count up and reduce the risk of infection, antiemetics that help prevent nausea and vomiting related to cytotoxic chemotherapy, these erythropoietin stimulating agents that help prevent anemia related to cytotoxic chemotherapy. And what I want to say about these drugs is that even though they don't treat the cancer, they definitely improve the quality of life of patients. And when I first started my training in oncology, we didn't have these drugs. And let me tell you, patients got really sick and it was very hard to get patients through treatment. So these drugs really made treatment so much easier for patients. We also developed these bone modifying drugs that help reduce the risk of bone fractures from cancer that's involved in the bone or from osteoporosis that can develop from the treatment of cancer. And these drugs greatly reduce the risk of bone fractures in cancer patients. The last point I want to make about these supportive drugs is just like we've had innovation in the treatment of cancer, in the last year we've had a number of new classes of supportive drugs that help reduce the side effects of chemotherapy. So this is an area that's also expanding. And now I just want to give you a brief history of chemotherapy. And so, you know, we had the question about what was the first drug used to treat cancer, and it was indeed nitrogen mustard. 
And you all may remember that nitrogen mustard was actually used as a chemical warfare agent in World War I. And so it is a cytotoxic drug. And so I dubbed this era from the 1950s through really most of the 1990s as the era of cytotoxic chemotherapy because that's about all we had to treat cancer were these cytotoxic chemotherapy drugs. I also want to note that in, in 1990, which is when I started my training in oncology, that we only had 34 cytotoxic drugs available to treat cancer. And so we just had to mix and match these into various regimens to treat cancer. And for most of this era, we did not have those good supportive drugs. And so this undoubtedly led the well-known Dr. McCoy uh, when the Star Trek crew traveled back to 1986 America and when they were in the hospital, Dr. McCoy overheard an oncologist talking about giving chemotherapy to a cancer patient. And you can see, he thought they were in the medieval era. And in a lot of ways, we probably were. So if this was the medieval period of cancer therapy, I would dub the year 1997 as really the beginning of the Renaissance, because this is when the first target therapy drug, the monoclonal antibody rituximab, was approved for lymphoma. And my very first patient I treated with this drug back in 1997, who had been really ravaged by side effects from cytotoxic chemotherapy, after her first treatment of rituximab, she dubbed it holy water. And she dubbed it that because her lymphoma immediately disappeared and she had no side effects. So this was the beginning of targeted therapy. Uh, the next important year was really 2001 when we had the first small molecule targeted therapy drug called imatinib, which was approved for a type of chronic leukemia called CML. And prior to approval of imatinib, the median survival of a patient with CML was around five years. But after imatinib came on the scene, the survival for patients with CML improved to being decades long. And many patients with CML we're now living normal life expectancies. So this really was a miracle drug and showed the promise of targeted therapy and treating cancer. I wanna also highlight the year 2003 because that's the year the Human Genome Project was completed. So we entirely mapped out the human genome. And the technology that we developed in mapping out the human genome could then be applied to cancer genomes. And we got, gained a lot better understanding about how cancers work and grow. And so following the Human Genome Project completion, there were over 140 targeted therapy drugs that have been approved since that time. Uh, and it's really due to the technology that we developed during the Human Genome Project. Now I've dubbed 2015 as really being the rise of immunotherapy. Now in all fairness, there were some immunotherapy drugs that were approved prior to nivolumab's approval in 2015 for lung cancer, but it was after the approval of nivolumab that we really began to understand the power of using immunotherapy to treat cancer. And following this approval, there was a rapid expansion of other indications for nivolumab and a number of new immunotherapy drugs have come on the scene. And now immunotherapy really serves as an important backbone to a lot of our treatments that we have for various cancers. And it was just a mere four years ago that the FDA approved the first CAR T cell therapy for leukemia. And we've now have five CAR T cell therapies approved for various leukemias, lymphomas, and multiple myeloma. Uh, and in a few moments, I'm gonna talk about some promising new technologies that may affect the way we treat cancer in the future. But first, I, I want you all to understand a little bit the rapid pace of innovation in oncology. And so what I've done on this slide is I've gone back and looked at the number of approvals by the FDA for new oncology drugs by decade. And then I've kind of broken down the annual average during that decade. And you'll see that we had an uptick in the approval of drugs in the, the 90s and early 2000s. But look what's happened in the last decade. We've had uh, roughly 16 new oncology drug approvals every year in the last decade. And then if we look at, you know, what are the type of drugs being approved? You can see that the vast majority of the drugs being approved, nearly 90% of the drugs being approved are the targeted therapy drugs that we just discussed. And so why is this important? Well, 
these drugs, as I've shown, are very expensive. And so they are largely what are driving the cost trends that we're seeing in medical oncology. I also want to highlight that these drugs are working very well and patients are living longer. That's a great thing. But it also means patients are staying on therapy longer. And so that is also driving some of the cost trends that we see in medical oncology. And so if that's the past, I just want to talk about a few technologies that I think may shape the future. And the first of these is nanotechnology. And so nanotechnology is the use of nanomaterials, so very, very small molecules that have unique physical and chemical properties. And scientists are really enthusiastic about the use of nanotechnology as a delivery mechanism to improve the delivery of cytotoxic chemotherapy or radioisotopes or even gene therapy directly into the cancer cell, thereby improving the effectiveness of these therapies, but also reducing the potential toxicity. There's also a lot of research going on on using nanotechnology uh, in leading to earlier cancer detection and diagnosis. The next area is what I call omics. And so pharmacogenomics is a branch of science and a branch of medicine that looks at the individual patient's genetic makeup and analyzes how that may influence how they may respond to a particular drug. And so there's hope that we can use this uh, technology to understand for individual patients what chemotherapy drugs may be most effective based upon their particular genetic makeup. So this is really holds the promise of improving personalized medicine. Radiomics is the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning capability and applying this technology to kind of standard imaging techniques that we do now, CT scans, MRI scans, and PET scans. And there's a lot of investigation on using these, this technology to allow us to be able to predict which patients might respond best to a given treatment. And there's also hope that this can improve our ability to diagnose cancers. And then finally, there's the branch of science called proteomics, which is looking at the proteins cancers make and utilize to grow and spread and trying to develop new therapies to target the specific proteins that cancers are using. And then the final area is adoptive cellular therapy for solid tumors. So I mentioned that CAR T cell therapy uh, that we've approved so far are, are all for blood-based cancers. It turns out that the CAR T cell technology we have right now doesn't work very well at all for solid tumors. But scientists are looking into other cells that we may be able to utilize, much like CAR T cell therapy, but apply to solid tumors like breast cancer, prostate cancer, and colon cancer. And so those are some of the future things that I think may impact the way we treat cancer in the next 10 to 20 years. And then I just want to take a moment to give you a little insight into the oncology patient's journey. And anytime an oncologist sees a new cancer patient, they weigh what are the goals of treatment? What are we trying to accomplish? And so obviously there can be curative therapy where we put the patient through a course of therapy and the cancer is eradicated and they go on and live a normal life. However, there are other therapies where we know it's not necessarily going to cure the cancer, but it can significantly prolong the life of the patient. And sometimes even a near normal life expectancy may be possible. So think of the imatinib example for the chronic myelogenous leukemia, the CML that I talked about earlier. Sometimes therapy is what we call palliative, where it's really designed to alleviate symptoms and improve the patient's quality of life. And even though palliative chemotherapy can sometimes improve survival, it's usually measured in a matter of months to a few years. And then finally, there does come a time in, in some cancers where there are no remaining effective therapies and the patient has no other options and their status is such that we have to move towards hospice or end of life care. It's also important to understand that there's different durations of chemotherapy treatments. There are some treatments that are a very fixed duration, and we can tell a patient, you're going to take this for six months and then be done. There are other treatments that maybe after we complete the initial uh, treatment, we then put a patient on a milder form of treatment as extended maintenance therapy that might go on for two to five years to further reduce the risk of the cancer coming back. 
And then there are times where we do chronic intermittent treatment. So this is commonly used in the palliative setting where we treat the patient with chemotherapy until their cancer has responded enough that they feel better, but then we stop treatment for a while and only restart treatment when the cancer starts to progress again. And then finally, there are some treatments that the patient just has to stay on indefinitely until the cancer progresses. And so imatinib is a good example of that. And so for most patients, you know, long-term monitoring for recurrence and progression is going to be necessary even for cured patients. And so the cancer journey really is a lifelong journey for cancer patients. And then I'd just like to close by just highlighting some of the ways that Evacor's oncology management solution deals with some of these topics that I have brought up today. And so the first is our Evacor OnConnect comprehensive oncology management solution. And so this is our integrated program that uh, contains both our radiation oncology program, our medical oncology program, our lab program, and our radiology imaging program. And these programs are integrated in a way that they follow the patient longitudinally, assuring evidence-based diagnostic and treatment throughout the patient's cancer journey. We have our medical oncology clinical decision support tool which can really support providers amidst this really rapidly changing evidence in oncology. Our precision oncology program can assure appropriate genomic and molecular testing and assures evidence-based prescribing of these target therapy drugs we discussed. We have a CAR-T management solution that can assure appropriate patient selection for this very innovative but high-cost therapy. And then there's a clinical trial matching and management program. Uh, where we can actually help identify studies that a patient may be eligible for, or we can help manage a patient once they're enrolled on a clinical trial. And this can really support the advancement of medical oncology knowledge. And then finally, our oncology case management and our advanced care programs that really help support the patient throughout their cancer journey. And so that's all I have to you today, and I really appreciate your attention. And with that, Rick, I'm going to turn it back over to you to see if we have any other questions. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Hamilton. That was a great overview of medical oncology history, current state, and what may, what may uh, lie ahead in the future. Your presentation was very helpful in improving understanding in this, what is clearly a, a complex field. And so now, uh, as you mentioned, we're going to begin the Q&A portion of the webinar. And as a reminder to our participants, please submit your questions using the Q&A panel of the WebEx. Uh, and uh, you know, please take advantage of this opportunity to, to ask uh, anything you'd like to know about medical oncology that Dr. Hamilton did not cover, or if you'd like him to expand upon something, uh, feel free to, to submit that to us as well. So we do have uh, just a couple questions here that have come in. And first off, um, this is one, uh, Dr. Hamilton, I, I think uh, it should be interesting uh, to hear your answer. So a lot of excitement around so many of the advances that are occurring in medical oncology. Uh, so are we getting closer to discovering the cure for cancer? Yeah, great question. And so uh, let me begin by answering that question by clarifying that, you know, cancer is not a single disease. It really represents, a, you know, a thousand different diseases. And, and let me also highlight that cancer is incredibly complex, and we have learned a lot in the last two decades in particular about the complexity of cancer. But I think when we consider the complexity of the cancer and the fact that it really is a thousand different diseases, that it's probably not realistic to expect that we will have a true cure for all cancers anytime soon. However, because of this very rapid pace of innovation in oncology and the new technologies allowing us to identify cancer at you know, an earlier, hopefully more treatable stage, and if we continue to develop better treatments, I think our ability to cure many of these type of cancers will improve over time. So we're making progress, but this is going to be a long-term project for us to get to the point that we can really say that we've cured cancer completely. Okay, very good. Thank you. And uh, we have a couple questions that are coming in with regard to CAR T cell therapy. So, uh, first off, um, how effective is CAR T cell therapy and 
could it be considered cost effective? Yeah, and so, um, you know, our current therapy uh, that is approved for CAR T cell therapy is for these relapsed and refractory forms of certain types of leukemia, lymphomas, and multiple myeloma. And so, these drugs, you know, I think it's important to understand they, these CAR T cell therapies were approved because this was a patient population that really had a very, very poor prognosis. And so the FDA approved these drugs on very immature data. But what we did learn from these clinical trials that were done with CAR T cell therapy is that the overall response rates, the cancer shrinking and, and sometimes even completely disappearing, the overall response rates were very high. So from that perspective, they were very effective therapies in this very difficult to treat patient population. Uh, what we don't really know right now is whether any of these CAR T cell therapies actually have the ability to cure some of these cancers. So we do have some patients now who had been treated in the original CAR T cell therapies for leukemia and some types of lymphoma, where we know that there are some patients that are out more than five years now following their CAR T cell therapy that are still in remission. So if a proportion of these treated patients end up being cured, or at the very least, they have you know, several years of remission, then I do think it is possible that despite the very high upfront cost of CAR T cell therapy, that it could end up proving to be a cost-effective treatment option. Okay, excellent. And a related uh, CAR T cell therapy question. Uh, so is CAR T cell therapy covered by health plans? Uh, and uh, if so, are there strategies um, to ensure that um, it's being used you know, in places where it is truly medically necessary and, and appropriate? Yeah, and you know, I think that I think the answer to that is, uh, you know, yes. I think most health plans, including uh, CMS, you know, has come out with a, an NCD for CAR T cell therapy coverage. So I think that most health plans are covering CAR T cell therapy, and and I think it is extremely important that you know the appropriate patients are being selected for this this very innovative but high cost therapy. And that means assuring they meet not only the clinical indications, again, they have to have relapsed refractory disease after so many other forms of standard therapy before they're eligible for CAR T cell therapy, but it's also extremely important to make sure that the patient is a good clinical candidate for the therapy. And by that, I mean that they have adequate organ function to undergo the rigor of CAR T cell therapy. And so, at Evacor, our CAR T cell management solution is handled by a subset of our board certified medical oncologists with special CAR T cell therapy training, and they can help be absolutely sure that the appropriate patients are being selected for this type of treatment. Okay, excellent. Uh, more questions are coming in. So let's see, uh, Dr. Hamilton, you mentioned biosimilars are on the market for some targeted therapies. Uh, are biosimilars possible for other classes of therapy? Um, the, 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 uh, what you're going to see, for particularly for the oral targeted therapy drugs, I think what you're going to see, rather than biosimilars, what you're going to see are generics. And so um, the answer to that is that yes, for for monoclonal, uh, you know, antibodies, there definitely will be for some of the other classes. Of, of therapy that are still under patent. I think you will eventually see biosimilars made for some of those. Um, but again, for the, the oral, um, you know, targeted small molecule targeted therapies, it's going to be more likely generic drugs that are going to drive down the cost of those drugs. Okay, very good. Uh, let's see, we've got time for, uh, I think, a few more questions. So. As new chemotherapy drugs are approved by the FDA, are they automatically added to Evacor's medical oncology program, uh, or does Evacor, you know, sort of, uh, you know, pick and choose which ones to include? Yeah, and so the, the any time there is a new drug approval, or if a you know a new drug is added to the NCCN guidelines, so you know our management solution is built around the NCCN guidelines, and so. Um, you know, any FDA-approved therapy uh, for cancer 
uh, is considered to be covered under our program. And so we do immediately add those as soon as those approvals go into place. We add that to our management solution. And, um, you know, I think it is important that, you know, oncology is such a complex area that as these new drugs come out on the scene, I think it's, it behooves all of us to really support the use of these drugs in the appropriate situation. And so, uh, you know, I would always recommend to a health plan to, uh, you know, cover uh, FDA approved and NCCN recommended therapies. Okay, very good. Uh, let's see, Dr. Hamilton, next question. Um, uh, is there anything that, uh, that is being worked on now or, or in, you know, available now that can help patients with stage four disease? And really the question, I guess, is more specific to, you know, reversing stage four disease or, or curing patients with stage four disease. Yeah, and, you know, I think that I will tell you that the advent of, you know, some of these new classes of drugs, the monoclonal antibodies, the immunotherapy drugs, patients with stage four cancer are living much longer than they ever did. So, you know, when I was first in practice, a patient with stage four colon cancer, if we were lucky, might live a year. Uh, today, patients with stage four colon cancer usually will live easily to three years and oftentimes to five years or longer. So we are making slow progress in improving how long patients can survive with stage four cancer. And I do think that there will come a point in the future where we may be able to talk about actually curing these patients. We're not there yet. Again, it's gonna take many years of research yet for us to get to that point, but we have definitely made progress in the last couple of decades. Excellent. Yeah, and I, I think we've seen that, right? And uh, many um, epidemiological studies that have come out recently showing that uh, we are improving overall survival for patients with cancer uh, exactly. broadly. Um, uh, but it's, you know, it's, 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 it's a progressive sort of iterative process of uh, testing and learning and clinical trials and uh, continuing to iterate. And as we do this, I'm going to fold in another question here from our participants. Um, and this one really has to do with access to care. Uh, and, uh, and, and this will be our last question because we're just slightly over time here. But um, uh, could you talk a little bit about how do we ensure that uh, patients are able to access the, you know, these therapies, these innovative therapies uh, that are uh, truly you know, the right ones for them? Yeah. And, you know, I think it's on all of us to work on that together. I mean, we, we definitely know, and I think the, the, the pandemic brought to light for uh, everybody, that there are definitely, you know, social determinants of health that are impairing access to, you know, high quality care. And I think every cancer patient deserves that high quality care and they deserve access to these very innovative therapies, particularly when these innovative therapies improve overall survival. And so I don't have an easy, you know, one sentence answer to how we solve that, but I think that if we all put our heads together and work together to try to improve access uh, of care for patients with cancer, uh, we'll eventually get to the point that everybody's receiving the highest quality of care possible. Yeah. Excellent. And, and I, let me just add to that a little bit, um, which uh, I'll get your reaction, but I think there's, there's also a role here for, you know, clinical decision support. And, and because of the complexity that you mentioned and this, this accelerating exponential complexity in medical oncology, um, there's a role for helping busy oncologists to really perform the right tests for, for their patients to obtain the correct and the most precise diagnosis, which then in turn you know, becomes helping those busy providers choose uh, the, the optimal evidence-based therapy for their patient. Absolutely, so you, you know, and, and that, yeah. and I, I don't think we can overstate how hard it is, especially, especially for the very busy oncologist who's out there taking care of patients every day, what a challenge it is to stay current with this rapid pace of innovation that's occurring in oncology. So fully agree with what you've said there, Rick. 
Okay, very good. Uh, we are out of time. Uh, I see there are uh, another couple, few questions that have come in, uh, and uh, we will we will uh, log those and follow up with you uh, and and provide an answer. So rest assured, uh, we will respond to your questions. Uh, I do want to thank you very much, Dr. Hamilton, for your time and expertise today, and a special thanks to all of our participants for joining and participating. We appreciate your time and attention and hope that you found today's webinar valuable. And uh, just a heads up, if you liked this presentation, please be on the lookout for our Radiation Oncology 101 Evacor Insights webinar. Uh, that will be coming in February with Dr. Raj Singla, who's the chief of Evacor's Radiation Oncology program. So that'll give you an opportunity to ask uh, all of your radiation oncology questions. And now, Bill Cornelius will provide some closing remarks. Bill? Thank you, Rick. First, I want to remind everyone that today's webinar was recorded and will be available on demand at evacor.com slash insights. Next, we'll be sending an email. We'll be sending email invitations for next month's webinar sometime in the next couple of weeks. So be on the lookout for that. We really hope to see you there. And finally, if you would like to learn more about our capabilities, including our suite of oncology solutions, please reach out to sales at evacore.com. Thank you again, Rick and Dr. Hamilton for sharing your expert knowledge with us today. Participants, thank you all for your attendance. This concludes the webinar. Have a great day.